Hi, everyone. Um, Kevin Carter, the web guy for the Casey Stengel chapter. We have with us today Don Rice, and he's going to give us a presentation on the Dykeman Oval Stadium, uh, home of the Cubans. So I'll turn it over to, to Donald. All right. Uh, let me start sharing the screen. Does everyone see a, a slide? OK. Yes. All right. Um, it's good to be here. Uh, my name is Don Rice. I live in North Manhattan, the neighborhood of Inwood. I've lived here for more than 20 years. And so this is my home stadium, uh, the Dykeman Oval. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take a, a deep trip through newspaper archives and uh, old photographs to find out some key moments of the uh, Dykeman Oval's history. There were just a few. It's a small stadium. It was only around for about 20 years, but uh, the 1935 Crawford's Cubans uh, Championship Series was two, at least two games were held here. And uh, it was sort of an independently booked stadium that held its own against uh, pr bigger promoters in the neighbor in the area like Nat Strong. OK, so it was also sort of a one of the home stadiums of the Harlem fans being nearby, just just let, just about a 15 minute subway ride on the A train and the one train. So uh, here's uh, Adrian Burgos's quote about the scene at Dykeman Oval uh, for the Harlem crowd. This is the iconic picture by Percy Spare uh, taken in 1937, pretty much at the end of the baseball, its baseball career, but it is the picture that we always see. It's after the, the Cubans have already played their last game here. And so, uh, uh, but, but it's the best picture we have of the Oval. There are only a few. Now let's see if I can move to the next slide. Okay, uh, this is one of my little things that I like to do, putting the present over the past. Uh, and uh, this is what the, deck, the location of the Oval Stadium would look like today if you were to uh, overlay that previous photo on top of the, the place it is now. You can see behind it are the housing projects of the Dykeman houses. They were built in the late, latest 40s. They opened in 1951. This was a stadium where Harlemites could feel separate from the indignities of racialized treatment, Lawrence Hogan says, a place of their own to celebrate their own. Um, if you're not familiar with North Manhattan, uh, Inwood is the northernmost neighborhood in Manhattan, above Washington Heights and above Harlem. And the Dykeman Oval was a whole city block with an irregular shape. Uh, and you can see it outlined in blue on the right, today's housing project. The Dykeman Oval was just part of that bigger complex. So it bounded by on the North Academy, by on the North 204th Street and on the South Academy Street and between Nagel Avenue and 10th Avenue. Uh, not every street is numbered in North Manhattan, in the northernmost neighborhood of Manhattan. Not every avenue is the typical downtown avenues. There are some different avenues and street numbers up here. So, uh, but the block still, it looks the same as it did when the stadium was there. And that's how I could do some measurements of the outfield using the tape measure of Google Maps and things. All right, uh, sports continue. I might as well just say this. Uh, right on the oval grounds, the Dykeman Park basketball tournament has been taking place since 1990. And this is also the housing project where Lou Alcindor grew up. And we can see him standing in front of the housing project in his baseball uniform for the Inwood Little League in 1959. Uh, but which one is he? <laughs> OK. Uh, so first, we'll do a little bit of background. And then most of this is uh, uh, going to be uh, from mining newspaper articles of uh, the, sh the uh, Chicago Defender and the New York Age, Amsterdam News. But the first mention in the press that is a reliable mention was in 1915 as a baseball field. We're going to find that you can't really go much before that because uh, of uh, it wasn't really built. The grandstand was created in 1917. But because of incredibly popular games, uh, that had to be uh, seating had to be increased in 1920, and then completely redone in 1935 when Alex Pompez took over the lease. And just three years later, 1938, the baseball and the stands are demolished. 
we can see three pictures across the bottom of the first two iterations are mostly the same. The Treatum Roughs in 1919, uh, uh, the Dykeman Oval Beer Garden in 1933, that's still during prohibition. And then the final uh, stadium, which is Alex Pomp has, is, has night lights and everything. We'll see those photos larger later. Let's see, I still want this thing to go forward. Hello. There we go. Uh, Pompez's beautiful miniature stadium, Lewis Style and the Amsterdam News. And these were measured using aerial photos. There are two aerial photos that are looking dead down at the oval. So I can use the tape measure tool on Google Maps to just line out the distances. And so these are approximate, but these were measured. Uh, they're, they're probably close enough. And we can see that it's a uh, uh, left field is very short center field, incredibly short. Babe Ruth had a quote about that. Uh, the short porch. Um, and then when Alex Pompez took over, he got the lease on the orange and the red areas on the right. So he could increase the stadium to be the full uh, city block. And that pushed out the outfield and especially the left field fences. Uh, some home teams, uh, Kingsbridge Athletics, semi-pro team uh, built the stadium. Then once uh, Sunday baseball became legal in 1919, Guy Empey bought an old North Manhattan team and made it his. Jeff Tesro took over the lease in 1920 and 21. Uh, and then there was a bunch of legal disputes and baseball sort of uh, took a rest until 1928 when another semi-pro team, Bronx Giants. Then it starts to pick up in 1932 with the New York Black Yankees for part of a season. And then finally with New York Cubans, 35 and 36 and the Black Yankees at 37. But some of the more interesting parts of the story are the teams that were not from New York, but used the stadium sort of as a home away from home, especially the Atlantic City back rack giants, bottom left. You can see 1916 through 1918, they didn't play any games in New York City, but in 1919, 12 games at the Oval, five games at Ebbets Field, 1920, it increases in 1921, 12 games, 16 games at uh, the Dykeman Oval and uh, 12 games at Ebbets Field. So that's at two games in the Bronx, that's almost 30 games in New York. Is that more than 30 games? Something like that. And same with Chicago American Giants, although much less, uh, four or six games in 1921 and four games in 1919. I'm still trying to get this thing to go forward. Uh, it's, I guess it's just going to skip, but we're part of a world here. So this is a, a world of semi-pro ballparks. Uh, Dykeman Oval doesn't exist in a vacuum. Uh, it's, the Harlem Oval is also, or Lenox Oval is, is down at 142nd Street, Catholic Protectory Oval, uh, the Bronx Oval, Olympic Field, Dexter Park, Hinchliffe, New York Oval, Washington Park. A couple of these are landmarks. Uh, there is zero left of the Dykeman Oval. There's no plaque. There's nothing that you can see that, is, uh, that remains of the stadium. But it was a working stadium and we'll just go through this. We're only gonna talk about baseball today, but we can see how for the, all the sports, uh, baseball is the predominant sport. There were years when boxing was very popular, uh, a few years at the end of its life, uh, Fritz Pollard and his Brown Bombers football team of NXX, NFL black players and college stars who couldn't find work in the NFL. They used the stadium as their home for three seasons. Uh, boxing, cricket, cricket in the early 30s and late 20s was a very popularly booked sport at the stadium. And then you've got your usual things, dance parties, motorcycle races, speed skating, uh, the works. Okay, so we'll, now we'll start our timeline. The Oval was sold so why is it called Dykeman Oval? Because that's the guy who owned it right there. Isaac Michael Dykeman sold it at an auction in 1870. And then it started to pass through several, several hands. There was a lot of real estate development. You can see on this map, there are all kinds of lots, looks like building lots, but there's nothing there. It's swampland and coastal marsh. Uh, there's no apartment buildings in 1870. There's really nothing until the 1900s. This is farmland that's all por portioned off. Uh, and so here we can actually see uh, in 1914, the earliest photo of the oval being filled in, 
part of the problem was that the oval was right next to uh, the Harlem River and it was partially inundated by tides twice a day. So we can actually see an infield being filled in here. Let's get go a little closer. We can see in 1914, infield fill being put in, but out in center field is still water. You can see reed grass and all that stuff. Uh, so any mention of the Dykeman Oval as a baseball park in 1914, Assuming the date on this photo is correct, uh, the, the earliest games could be played would be like the end of 1914 or later after this business is completely uh, finished. And by 1917, it, there is a notification in the New York Herald that the Dykeman Oval has been leased for baseball. The promoter is Connie Savage, Cornelia Savage. Uh, the team that's leasing it is Kingsbridge Athletics, semi-pro team up in Kingsbridge possibly displaced. Kingsbridge is the neighbor, neighborhood next to the Northeast, uh, possibly displaced because the American League ballpark that turned into Yankee Stadium was temporarily going to be built in Kingsbridge. Uh, and this was a, an aborted plan. This is after the Highlanders lost their lease at the uh, 168th Street, but before Yankee Stadium opened, different sites were entertained. So Kingsbridge, this team moved down to Inwood to play, and I still would like to find out why. This wants to go two ahead. So that's gonna just be what happens. I'm gonna go two ahead and one back. Uh, here in the New York Sun, the Dykeman Oval has been fenced off. We could see it and a grandstand has been built. This is the birth of the stadium right here in April of 1917. Um, the first team is going to be the Cuban Giants, Roy Morse, uh, uh, ex major, major leaguer is going to pitch, and uh, they talk about the personnel, different people who've had different tryouts for different teams, a little bit of baseball news, and critically within a stone's throw of the Dykeman Street subway station. This is one of the um, aerial shots that I used to take the measurements. This is from 1921, and here it we can see on the left at the at the right angle. That's where the home plate's gonna be. You can see the uh, uh, bleachers or grandstands, and we can see the outfield, the left field and the right field fence and what looks like fence posts out in center field. And the, and the Sherman Creek, which is part of the Harlem River right below it. So that's all been bullhead, bulkheaded. And so now there's no more tidal wetness. Close up, we can see it's a small ballpark. This is another um, uh, aerial photo from 1924, and we can actually see the outfield walls now. To, so this can actually be measured against, uh, with some accuracy, against a modern photo of the block. 300 feet to left field, 265 to center, 325 to right. We can see the infield, uh, um, and we can see we can see everything that we need to see to sort of get an idea about where the grandstands were. Uh, about how many, like we see two, two grandstands down the right field line. This is Babe Ruth's quote after he played there in 1920. The right field wall of this park was so close in that if you didn't lock, knock a line drive to the fielder, you were pretty near bound to bunt a home run. And here's the first home team, the 1914 Kingsbridge Athletics featuring Andy Coakley. Uh, pitched his last season for the Highlanders and um, was about ready to, he probably was already coaching at Columbia by then. And one of the early teams, this might have been when Alex Pompez discovered Dykeman Oval. Alex Pompez uh, in the 1917 Evening World, this is their first, uh, I guess, official season. Um, Kingsbridge Athletics versus the Cuban Stars. And so now we'll just show a few slides from this era and then we'll get into where the story gets meaty. Uh, Chief Bender and his uh, barnstorming team playing the Kingsbridge Athletics after the, se after the season, probably the first Hall of Famer. Did I? I might've missed an important slide, but that's okay. And a lot of games like this, the Grand Central Red Caps, uh, uh, Penn Station Red Caps playing uh, games up here. Then it became, this is what started to put it, the stadium on the map for Harlem. 
New York Giants, barnstorming after their season, playing the Philadelphia Giants. And then in 1919, uh, we start to actually see some real action here because this guy, uh, Guy Empey, was a visionary. He had been, uh, uh, he had battled in the World War I and enlisted via England so that he could fight early. Uh, he had strong political views um, and uh, was very sympathetic to veterans. He was wounded himself, came back and started a team called, which he called the Treatum Roughs. Lee Steichman Oval and wanted to um, donate proceeds to prosthetic limbs from all the guys who had had arms and legs knocked off from landmines. Um, and here's Club Habana coming in from Cuba, playing at the Oval. And now our story really begins. So there's our background information and our antagonist for the evening is promoter Nat Strong uh, of the Intercity Association, uh, the National Association of Colored Baseball Clubs for a few years. He was a, he coordinated many probably the majority of bookings, schedules, rosters, payouts for, for a majority, or at least a hundred teams at first of the of semi-pro baseball in New York City. He's also a part owner for several teams. He And he was very turf conscious. He prevented a lot of out of town teams from coming in and affecting his profitability. Uh, they didn't like him coming in to play in New York City. He uh, feuded with John Connor, ruining their relationship. In 1913, he rested the ownership of uh, the Brooklyn Royal Giants away from restaurateur Jean Connor. Then in 1915, he sent some of his teams out to Chicago, poking Rube Foster. Uh, Rube didn't like that. And though, he, and he got along well with Alex Pompez. Sources say uh, Pompez helped him find Latin American talent, but he fought against eventually bringing the New York Cubans into the uh, Negro National League and shortly before his death. So Connor held it. He didn't like it. He lost his team. He, he loved the Royal Giants. Eventually, he invested in the uh, Atlantic City Backrack Giants and got even by offering better paying contracts to some of his favorite players to come play for him in Atlantic City. Uh, Nat Strong didn't like that. And uh, as a matter of fact, he... Uh, well, he, here's his quote. After several Royal Giants left for better paying contracts with the Backrack Giants, Nat Strong co told Connor and Wilkins, the owners, at a meeting that they were making things bad by offering these coons more money. And the Chicago Defender headline said, slavery is still in existence even in New York because Nat Strong thought that these players should know their place and not look out for themselves. Uh, so that got Connor riled up uh, and he sidestepped strong and he was able to book games at Dykeman Oval through, through um, Connie, 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 Connie Savage, the promoter there. So from 1914 to 1919, no black teams had played from the Midwest had played uh, uh, in Gotham under strong control, or at least he strongly discouraged and he sort of opened the door selectively. Uh, but Connor ended up uh, negotiating a contract with Connie Savage at Dykeman Oval. Uh, and it, although Strong unsuccessfully retaliated in the short term, I think in the long term, uh, uh, Strong did win. This is a great photo. It's a postcard of the Treatum Roughs playing. And so what, what Connor did was he negotiated a deal with Guy Empey through his promoter, Connie Savage, to bring uh, Atlantic City baseball and the Backrack Giants to New York City, close to Harlem, and where they could actually play for a home, a home away from home crowd. And on July 27th, 1919, Backrack Giants come up for the first time and dominate the Treatum Roughs. 18,000, this is a stadium that holds 2,000 people. 18,750 fans were reported to have paid admission. 10,000 fans came from Harlem, according to the Chicago Defender. And the next week, uh, Guy Empey hired Jeff Tesro, who was uh, feuding with John McGraw and taking a season off from the Giants. Um, and so he was able to play some uh, semi-pro ball. Guy Empey welcomes the Harlem crowd 
and announces independence from Nat Strong in these two articles, the Chicago Defender, Guy, Guy MP on August 9th, both from August 9th, saying that he would join hands with Connor and Wilkins to eliminate Nat Strong and other magnets from the control of Eastern semi-pro ball. Those are strong words. Those are fighting words. And Guy Empey also told the sporting writer of the Chicago Defender that race Harlem was welcome at to his grounds. He says, I am very democratic in my views. And while we all figure from a business point of view, I believe in treating a man as a man, regardless of his color. Race Harlem is welcome to Dykeman Heights at all times. And a month later, Rube Foster brings his team to the Dykeman Oval at 17,500 is nothing compared to 25,000 who came, who hadn't had, who hadn't been able to see this team for five years. Um, they beat the Treat'em treat Roughs again. And uh, uh, Rube Foster's first game in New York City in several years with three Hall of Famers on the roster. By the end of November, the Treat'em Roughs were actually coming together as a team. They were playing super well and they won the New York City Semi-Pro Championship, beating the Lincoln Giants at the Oval in front of 10,000. But in this article in the New York Herald, Frankie Frisch is, is uh, uh, temping <laughs> for the Treat'em Roughs and uh, hits a home run. But that was just for one year. And Guy Empey was a, a movie star, a songwriter. He was a celebrity. Uh, he uh, wrote books, a best-selling book about his experiences in World War I. So he was moving on. And Jeff Testro, I mean, Jeff Testro decided to take a stab at running a semi-pro team. And the first thing he wanted to do, since the uh, uh, gate receipts were really, I mean, the people were coming to the Oval in droves, he wanted to improve it. So he's the Chicago defender saying Dykeman Oval will be enlarged for the 1920 season. To say the least, it is needed and needed badly. It has been uncomfortable for hundreds of spectators who paid 50 cents and could not obtain seats, who've been hard on the outfielders, probably sitting around, sitting on the outside of the outfield, looking past those fence posts that we saw earlier. And word spreads. And of course, since uh, Rube Foster has been there already, uh, after the ne National Negro League team uh, uh, league is founded, um, he negotiates to bring his teams to New York through the Oval in 1920. And that meant a tense negotiation uh, coming to New York with uh, Connie Savage, Jeff Tesro representing the Oval, also with John Connor. Also with Nat Strong, that must have been a heck of a meeting. And it, but what came out of it was that many of the Western teams under Rube's control will be sent to the Oval after June to, pl to play their games on Sundays, Saturdays. Connie Savage, according to the Chicago Defender of May 8th, was the prime mover at this peace conference. And um, the Backrack Giants continue to play. They become Harlem's favorites of the year. A goodly portion of the 110,000 souls, the article says, make their way up to the game. Doctors, boot blacks, bartenders, soldiers, sailors, and Sunday school teachers. Endless caravans of people heading uptown. And uh, late at the end of the season, um, Babe Ruth makes his first of two appearances at the Oval. This is where he uh, uh, wrote in an article that had a byline, Babe Ruth, that, about the short uh, uh, bunting a home run. So this is his, uh, after this is the, at the end of his first season as a Yankee. He hits two homers, pitched in relief, 5,000 fans came to see him. He had just set a new major league record of 54 homers. Uh, then the Lincoln Giants defeat the New York Giants Cyclone Joe Williams strikes out 13, defeats the New York Giants four to one, and the Giants had finished second in the National League that year. Getting ready for the next season, Jeff Tesro worked two seasons at the Oval, I think, yeah. And uh, here's the only team I've been able to find of his team, uh, 1921. I don't know where this picture was taken, 
but this is his barnstorming team uh, and the season's opening on April 10th. A gang of men has been at work refreshing the stadium, getting it all ready. This is getting ready for the 1921 season. Uh, by then, the mayor even knew about Dykeman Oval and uh, he shows up to toss out the first ball. Uh, there's some, he doesn't have a ticket. He has to talk his way in. And it turns out that Mayor Highland could really send the ball over the plate uh, with considerable speed, the reporter says. Probably the only appearance of Lou Gehrig at the Oval. He was, this was at, right after high school for him, the summer after high school, Commerce High School graduate um, playing for the New York Federal Sugar Team, according to what the inscription on the photograph is. And they played on the, at the Oval on July 31st, 1921. They lost the game. And Mayor Hyland returns again, this time to see Rube Foster play. He comes back again in October. The guest of honor at the American Giants Baccarat Giants game last Sunday was Mayor John Hyland. He shook hands with Rube Foster and several of the visiting Chicago players. So this, these first years were some of the highlights, uh, some of the high points of the Dykeman Oval. And the next high points are going to happen when Alex Pompez comes in the mid thirties. Um, what, does, what happens in between? The owners, the owners of the Oval, James Butterly, Warden Davis. Uh, I mean, how many owners are there? How many days do we have to talk about it? These guys were so dysfunctional. Um, and not only that, the city thought that it, the city, New York City thought it owned the Oval because the tides made the Oval wet. And if the tides made the Oval wet, it was New York City land. So uh, New York City sues the owners to get the oval. And so the, the owner, James Butterly, finds a buyer, doesn't tell him that the oval is going to be in the middle of a court case uh, and sells the oval off to uh, two promoters, Ward and Davis, who are more interested in boxing than baseball. And New York wins the oval's property in 1922, uh, the courts, the 1923 courts award the Oval to New York City. It goes to appeal in 1924. It reverts back to private ownership and takes away two, three, four, five baseball seasons because people don't want to book at a place if they don't know if it's going to be open. 1924, this is the photo that we've seen earlier. Uh, and then we're going to skip ahead to 1929. A rare game of the Lincoln Giants playing at the Oval. Uh, and they um, beat the Carlton, play the Carltons, but the important, the actual thing that makes it an interesting game is these these Hall of Famers that were there that day. Okay, we're going to skip ahead to 1932. This is the partial season of the New York Black Yankees. Training at Columbia at Baker Field nearby. And they begin their season. Um, the Dykeman Oval ownership was still not really getting it together when it comes to baseball and treating their players right and paying people. And so in this June 11th article, is it, we, it describes how the Black Yankees quit Dykeman Oval after Satchel Page strikes out 13, after Josh Gibson goes five for five, after the stadium screws the players and doesn't pay the Black Yankees have had enough and they quit. Nineteen thirty-three. This is just a quiet, a quiet street. Not much going on. We can actually take a closer look. Anticipating repeal of prohibition, a freshly painted beer garden sign. This is the small stadium. So this would be the. Uh, Right field, first, yeah, that, those are the locker rooms in through that door and the, and the office. Okay, so here we can see in 1934, the la one of the last photos of the old stadium. What we can actually see is that the neighborhood, which was all farmland at the beginning, is now uh, filled with apartment buildings. And, uh, 
Alex Pompez, who had played at the Oval earlier, long ago, probably kept it in the back of his mind. He wanted to join the second national Negro National League. Uh, he didn't have a home field. His uh, application got nixed. Plus, Nat Strong was against uh, adding a strong New York City team to the, mar to the market. Um, Black Yankees went to Dykeman Oval, according to the Amsterdam News, and met with failure. The stands had, had seen their better days. The field was not great. Uh, conspired to ensure their failure, plus corrupt uh, stadium officials. But the plans of Alejandro Pompez call for the creation of a real team, which will more than hold its own, and he was willing to invest a lot of money to rebuild the stadium. But Nat Strong was against it, and who knows how it would have played out. We were just talking before the talk started about a, a, a moment last month where the facts led up to a place and then an alternate story kept going. Uh, but what happened was almost stranger, truth stranger than fiction. Right as the battle was about to start, Nat Strong drops dead of a heart attack. January 1935, right when the decision is going to be made, uh, he's a powerful figure in baseball. He, was, he didn't want this team, but he's now out of the picture. And uh, right on the eve of the conference, which had announced its intention. They, were, they still intended to bring this ball club in. Nat Strong dies. The team is admitted to the Negro National League for 1935. And uh, Alex Pompez immediately gets to work rebuilding the stadium. Architects overlook, looking over the stadium, enlarging it to 12,000 person paid people, pay a capacity, uh, better player accommodations, and more and more and critically, really, to make it a, a, a better stadium was increasing the, its size. So, in here in the New York Age, we can see that uh, that it's a let was acquired from the other two property owners, and the fence moved back. He installed he installed box seats. He put a cover over for so that you could uh, for sun and rain, or and. Uh, um, Actually, even night lights, which are were new in Manhattan anyway, they were, they had already been used elsewhere. And he went to spring training, got his team. Here's some pictures of the 1935 Cubans in Florida at spring training. I transcribed the names from the back of the photos, so I hope I got came close. The handwriting was hard to read. Pitchers, infielders, and outfielders. And here's the new stadium with the night light pylons, night game pylons. Ten thousand people showed up for opening day for the new team. Um, Pittsburgh beat the Cubans. It actually took a while for the Cubans to gel. Crawford's really caught fire that year. One of their one of their better teams. Um, Effa Manley brings. The, her uh, Eagles to the Brooklyn, Brooklyn Eagles to the stadium. That's not a picture at the Oval. And uh, actually, as the, as the season went on, the Latins from Manhattan started to become the nickname of this team, made up from people from Puerto Rico, from the Dominican Republic, from Mexico, uh, from Cuba. This was a, a strong team that Pomp has fielded, including Martin Tejigo. All right. Um, 6,000 fans come and see the diminished Chicago American Giants. And new, they divide a doubleheader with, uh, and the Homestead Grays are coming. They were, they were completely outclassed by the New York Cubans. One of the things that I've been trying to find is pictures of players that are identifiably from the oval. And right now, there's not that many. And this is the only one that I've been able to really, that's a good photo that I can confirm now. It's uh, Fast Jenkins and Bill Yankee, Bill Yancey at the oval, probably playing on the Black Yankees. But you can, but the thing that's identifiable is the apartment building behind them. It's a 204th street, so it totally makes sense. It has those interesting 
gabled little apartment roof things at the top of the apartment building that are identifiable in the photo. Um, the Crawfords won the first half of the season, dominated the first half of the season, and then the Cubans gelled and came back and won the second half of the season. So they were the two teams in the championship series. Here we can see World Series opens in New York Saturday, 1935 Negro National League Championship Series. Games one and three, series went the distance. Games one and three were at Dykeman. New York won games one, two, and four. So they were up three to one before Pittsburgh came back to win it all. Um, huge talented here. Uh, Josh Gibson, Cool Papa Bell, Oscar Charleston, Judy Johnson, Martin DeHigo, Alex Pompez at six Hall of Famers that I can count. And let's come on, go to the next slide. There we go. And the Crawfords rallied to win. They rallied in almost every game. Um, the 1935, this is a, in this Pride of Smoketown, a new Saber publication from last year in the Thomas Kern essay. Uh, the 1935 Crawford squad might have been the best team of all time in the Negro Leagues. They won the first half title, defeated the second half winners, the New York Cubans, in the New York National League Championships, four games to three. And the, the champs were feted at the Dykeman Oval on September 28th. And uh, the final two games won the Cubans leading up until the last innings. So they just didn't, didn't have the gas in their tank to finish the job. And so, and immediately after that, Babe Ruth comes back looking different. It's been 15 years <laughs> and here he is. He has been, uh, he's done with New York. He's done with Boston. And uh, this is his first last game. And so uh, the Amsterdam news did not treat him kindly. Here we can say, here, here, this quote from October 5th, without Ruth, the chumps, pardon, I mean the stars were like bread without yeast. The umpire called a halt to the slaughter in the second game in the name of humanity, but the official reason was darkness. And then they ended with a rather salty quote, so-called semi-pro and minor league white ball tossers have absolutely no business in the same town with the top flight Negro teams to say nothing of in the same ball yard at the same time. Ouch. But people loved him. People wanted, people continued. I mean, he put on a batting ex exhibition and of course hit numerous balls out of the park. Um, sort of bookended his uh, New York career at the Dykeman Oval. 1936 wasn't as fantastic a year. That is a good photo though, however, but uh, Satchel Paige was back with Pittsburgh and uh, 10,000 fans came to see him pitch at the Dykeman Oval on May 9th, uh, Chet Brewer versus Satchel Paige. I would love to find the original photo of this uh, this is uh, because this is taken at the Dykeman Oval during a game with Buck Leonard hitting a home run in the Amsterdam News. So there's a lot that I'm waiting for COVID to end so I can actually get out and get out and go to these libraries and get out and go to these institutions and find these photo morgues and, and, and do more than sit at a computer to do research. Uh, it didn't, it was not all computer work though, but Black Yankees um, take are, are uh, playing against. This is Cubans' last game. Yankees, Cubans. What I'm not really, what I can't really explain fully is that Alex Pompez has a very large story going on through these seasons as a numbers. Uh, he had a numbers game that he ran. Um, he was under. Uh, extreme pressure from the mob and from uh, uh, New York New York State authorities. Uh, he fled to avoid uh, arrest to Mexico, and so his dysfunction so, sort of prohibited his, his team from playing in 1937. And so the Cuban team in this headline from 1937 we see is 
Cubans are disbanded for 1937 because Pomp has, uh, is unable to run the team. So the Black Yankees take over the stadium. Black Yankees make Dykeman Oval their home. Um, the Cubans, some form of the Cubans briefly return for one game, possibly put together by an owner of the stadium. Uh, the reorganized Cubans play a game in, in August, uh, reorganized, but with the sponsorship of Judge Flato, who may have owned the ballpark at that time. Another thing that I'm waiting for uh, institutions to reopen so that I can see. Great photo of the Black Yankees, a team photo at Dykeman Oval, May 1937. And this is the photo that actually you can actually see how the inner inside of the stadium this uh, looks. If you if you kind of look between the heads and the shoulders, you can actually sort of see how the seating took place. It's a small ballpark compared to uh, what other other things that are out there. And the last baseball game at the Oval, probably September 1937, Black Yanks beat the Washington Elite Giants. After this game, there's football season. And so this would be when Fritz Pollard's team would be taking to the gridiron. And I think the next photo, this is the last aerial photo of the Dykeman Oval that, and the only photo that shows the enlarged ballpark. But you can actually see if you look closely, it's set up for football at that time. So different from the photos in the 20s when there are almost no apartment buildings. And now we can really see a city has grown up around uh, these teams at this place. There we go. And uh, Alex Pomp has his, his, he had a three year lease, 1935, 1936, 1937. He's in legal trouble. He doesn't renegotiate. He doesn't extend. And so the owners tear the oval down. Uh, the lease is over. Here's a headline, the earliest headline that I found describing the destruction of the, of the oval from February in a Los Angeles paper of all things, the California Eagle. Famous Dykeman Oval in New York to be torn down. Sports enthusiasts grew maudlin this week as workmen commenced the destruction of the Dykeman Oval. In a week or so, the field will be just another empty lot. Hmm. And they filled the empty lot with cars. This is the last photo of the Dykeman Oval that's known. It is the Dykeman Oval, except there are no fences. Uh, just um, cars parked during World War II because of gas rationing. The owners just sort of tabling their vehicles for until uh, gas became more accessible. 1948, the city gets serious and doesn't take the owners to court. It just uses eminent domain and takes the land, pays, pays the owners and takes the land. You can see in the yellow area, that's where the Dykeman Oval was. Um, they condemned the property, paid the owners off and uh, built the Dykeman housing projects there, which opened in 1951. And the owner, perhaps the last owner, is the lawyer on the left in red, I.T. Flato, sued not to stop the project, just to get him more time, which he was granted. OK, now we're just going to do a little bit of map overlaying to see the stadium overlaid with a current photo. And we're gonna, it takes three or four images to do it. Here's the original property, 1930, no, no grandstand pictured in this map, but a 1935 map shows grand the grandstand. And this would be uh, Alex Pompez's stadium where on the, the yellow on the left are the club offices and lockers. And then the gray is the uh, grandstand. So now I'm going to keep, I'm going to fill those things in and bring us up to the modern day. We can see the bounding streets. Now I'm going to bring the, a more modern map with the housing project. This is all going to lead to me trying to find home plate on a little adventure. 
and then overlaying a photograph of the structures with the grandstand so we can actually see if I did this right, and I think I did, that the grandstands and most of the infield are not within a building. Uh, they're in a parking lot or on sidewalks or, or on the grass. So this is a place that you can go if you want to make a field trip. And so uh, last fall, we got out our tape measures and our maps and visited the site using these overlays and try to find where the infield bases would be just to have some fun. So we can, so home plate could be in the middle of this parking lot and I believe it is. Pit, the pitch mound, first base, all these places are not, have not been built over, they, you can visit. So the approximate location of um, the infield. Well, that kind of does it for this talk. What it all comes around from is many, many sources. Uh, Rory Costello has written a really great essay about the Dykeman Oval. It's on the Sabre. Um, Rory and Kevin Johnson helped me sort of focus this talk and see how it could be presented in a way that made sense because there's so many things that happened, so many sports, how do you, how do you focus it? And then of course, all these other publications and newspaper databases, seamheads.com, all the books, um, books about teams like the, the Bacharach Giants or the Chicago American Giants. These are really great for finding the, team, the, the, the game records to make sure that I didn't uh, miss something or, so this was all, um, man, it took a lot. It sort of occupied a whole year. If you wanna imagine Josh Gibson, and could, you could meet him and say, let's go and throw a pitch to him. This is what it might look like today. So this is the Dykeman Oval today, about where home plate is, about where the pitcher's mound is, and about where all the cars are parked still. <laughs> um, and that's our last slide for the night. I, I doubt any of us would get a pitch past, uh, past Josh. Yeah, <laughs> it, was, it was very, very great. Uh, well, well presented and, and well done. There's some uh, chat on the bottom, if you oh, could look at. Let me see. How do I find that? I, can, uh, I have a menu on the bottom that says chat. I'm going to stop the share. Now I see it. Oh, someone lived at 99 Dykeman Street. You know, one thing that I forgot to mention was that after, after um, the Dykeman Oval was demolished, immediately, since, the name, since there was name recognition, a second Dykeman Oval started advertising boxing matches and concerts and even horse shows, but it was not at the same place and it only lasted a short time. So I didn't include the second or the new Dykeman Oval but that was right near 99 Dykeman Street, far to, that's far to the east. Is that correct, Joseph? Far? Yes. Yeah. Uh, on top of the hill, it was a low income, I'm, I'm sorry, middle income housing project. Yeah. So my, my family went from poverty to middle poverty. Uh, we, we lived in Brooklyn in the Williamsburg housing projects, not too far from where Nat Strong uh, at, at, in Bushwick, uh, dominated the, the game. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you a question, if I may, about football. Yeah. One of the remarkable things about the Negro Leagues is that they were multiply talented. They played more than one sport. Fat Jenkins, you showed a picture of. He was a basketball and baseball. Nat Sweet Porter Clifton, who played for the Wrens and the Globetrotters, was also a baseball player. Uh, Fritz Pollard brought his uh, team, many of whom were blacklisted when in 1934, the NFL said no more blacks. And yeah. some of the players, including a famous Cardinal, his name escapes me now, uh, a running back played. Could you tell us something about the football games that were played at the uh, 
Dykeman. Yeah. Uh, uh, the Oval. The Brown Bombers were the name of yes. the team. About for about 15 years, the NFL didn't hire black players, and I think it, maybe 1934 was the first year that all the contracts had been expired. Uh, yeah, Joe Lillard. Joe Lillard was the famous. Yeah. Black came to me. Yeah. Joe Lillard was their star, and uh, yeah. Fritz Pollard had been the first black uh, coach, head coach of the right. 1921 Akron Pros. And then that's there was, true. There wasn't another black head coach until the 80s or 90s. I mean, for decades and decades and decades, so long that. By uh, now, I'm trying, was it was it? Uh, uh, they were undefeated. Was it the, was it the Raiders who hired a? Anyway, um, yeah. So three for so for three years, uh, Fritz Pollard had a professional football yeah. team, and they played at the at the Oval. Thirty five, thirty six, thirty seven. They kept going, yeah. but then obviously not at the Oval. And uh, Pollard just did the three seasons before he was done as coach. Uh -huh. um, they were there was a great Sports Illustrated article about that team. Um, yeah. Did I bring it with me? I didn't. They were known oh, for singing it. spirit. They were known for singing spirituals as they yeah. came to the line. Wow! Thank uh, you so much. This was such a good uh, presentation. I loved it. Thanks. Let's see if there's anything else. Uh, Ryan Schroer, mile south of Columbia University's Bakerfield. Yeah, that's mm. about where the Oval is. And Bakerfield is as far north as you can get in Manhattan. That's up at 218th Street. Mm. Uh, and then there's the river at 220th about, or 220 whatever. So the the uh, uh, Columbia University's Bakerfield um, is nearby and they they are about the same vintage i think bakerfield began in the early 20s i think let's see anyone else have a question it's a fascinating subject it has a couple of juicy moments and it's a part of new york history thank you well, thank, thank you. you thank you very much and thank you to everyone for coming uh this will be uh it's been recorded and will be on sabers national site and I'll also put a link on our chapter site. And uh, thanks very much to Don for, for a well done presentation. And everyone take care and be, be healthy. Thank you. Take care, yeah. everyone. All right.